I V M. Hi, we're Team Splano. Welcome to an all-new episode of Press Decode, a weekly podcast where we take Splano's mission to declutter the news one step further. Check out our newsletter for more stories and follow us at Splano Inn to keep up with all the fun things we plan for our Splano fam. So sit back, relax, and don't let the news give you the blues. I'm Sara, and I have with me Adya and Bhakta. Take it away, Adya. Hi. I'm Madhya. I'm the bubbly cheerleader friend who is constantly battling the stereotype that a vegetarian foodie is an oxymoron. I'm Vagda. I'm a lawyer and a morning person who struggles to sleep on time. Not irresponsible in any other sense, but I don't charge my phone until the two percent battery warning. Lie, she still doesn't charge it, but always getting emails when her phone gets off in the middle of a call. Anyway, I'm Sara, your host for the day. Some say I'm funny, and some others would say I am the joke. Well, I guess you guys can listen in and decide for yourselves. We already know, Sara. I wasn't asking you to decide, Adya. <laughs> <laughs> we have three segments for you today. In our big story, we will look at Texas's near ban on abortion. In our food for thought segment, we will look at Sadhvi's plan to auction a shredded Banksy painting. And finally, we will be roasting or toasting our fave and least fave items. And we have some good ones today, so make sure you stick around for that. All right, let's begin with our big story. Last week, a shocking U.S. Supreme Court decision okayed a Texas law that virtually bans all abortion. It's one of many heartbeat laws that have been in the pipeline but have otherwise been blocked by legal challenges. So, what does this law actually say? All abortions, once cardiac activity, can be detected in the embryo, which is at around six weeks, are prohibited. And there are almost no exceptions to this six-week rule. No, not even for cases of rape and incest. The only narrow exceptions, pregnancies that could endanger the mother's life or seriously and irreversibly cause bodily damage. Amongst many reasons why this may be a problem, the most glaring ones are that most women don't actually know they're pregnant within the first six weeks. And more importantly, the heartbeat that is being spoken about, that's been spoken about, isn't actually cardiac activity, but actually it comes from a tissue called the fetal pole. So it's not even a heart, anyway. And the most shocking part of this provision is that it doesn't actually sue the po- person who undertook the abortion, but anyone who, and I'm going to quote here, knowingly engages in conduct that aids or abets the performance or inducement of an abortion. So. Think your Uber driver, your doctor, your relatives, anybody who was part of the process can be sued for about ten thousand dollars in damages. And that's insane. No. Yep. And why the law is crafted so absurdly is it prevents abortion rights activists from suing to block the law before it can pass. So basically, if the law planned to strip, say, all abortion providers of their medical licenses, a plaintiff could sue the medical board. But here. Unless a lawsuit is actually filed under the new law, there is no target that can be sued. So the law could basically pass. Ah, okay, hmm. makes sense. Technical loopholes. Yes, exactly. And this, that's not the end of the loopholes. Moreover, government officials are not actually allowed to, en- like, are not needed to enforce the law. Instead, it will be enforced through civil lawsuits brought in by private individuals. This means. Anyone can, like anyone who files, anyone can firstly file the case, and anyone who files the case because it's a civil lawsuit, they're safe from any legal costs if they lose. On the other hand, the defendants are liable to pay the legal bills of the people suing them in case they lose. Hmm. It basically sets up a bounty system of sorts where regular Texans are incentivized to report abortion. Oh my god, this is the shittiest part of the of the whole law. Right, like setting up. Yeah, like it's like. I would do, do. People could just do it for money. They're like, oh, I'm like, because if it's not actually financially draining for them, there's no reason for them to not file an abortion. This is like an equivalent of cow slaughter law, but in the US. <laughs> and for women, not cows. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Yes. Oh my god. So yeah, overall, a law that has had a lot of thought, just sinister thoughts. <laughs> Uh, And it's extremely terrifying because it may well be the first step towards overturning a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy across the United States. Because like I said, there are multiple such laws that have been in the pipeline in different states. 
So, and the United States, which is known as the wealthiest and advanced democracies in the world. So, but also like very, very not forward in terms of like women's rights. They've always been so much. That is women true. rights have come so much later for them. That is true. So, on that note, do you guys actually know what the law says in India? You know, so like comparatively, abortion is a lot simpler in India, and not really an issue of electoral importance like in the US. You know, here the government has. other priorities now i haven't fully finished my research into india's uh, population policy but from the little i have read population control and sterilization have deep rooted imperialistic ideals in india and that's what is our priority population control is our priority so there's a lot of writing on this i mean we've had population policy since independence thanks to margaret sanger who you all should definitely read about because we're taught about population control and family planning in our civics syllabus in school you know yeah. but it has a really like a whole other side if you look into it how it came about we have strict sterilization targets which by the way are heavily skewed towards sterilizing more women than men even when vasectomy is a much simpler and safer procedure than like tubal ligation and if you want it to be worse the numbers are skewed towards sterilizing lower caste and poor women if you see the figures because sterilization is done on the basis of cash incentive oh wow i'm not even surprised at this point like cash in every way like this texas law is also like financially incentivizing and so is this sterilizing in india again incentivizing through cash they're like yeah. we know what yeah. you want and that's where we'll hit so in india population control is a much bigger priority अगर पॉपुलेशन कंट्रोल इज योर प्रायोरिटी अबॉर्शन तो अलाउड होगा ना मतलब इट्स लाइक कंट्रोलिंग पॉपुलेशन राइट यस सो इज दैट लाइक अ साइड बेनिफिट ऑफ बीइंग अ विक्टिम ऑफ इंपीरियलिज्म ऊफ आउच ओके दिस इज जस्ट गेटिंग मोर स्ट्रेसफुल बाय द मिनट दिस एंटायर या ओके सो एनीवे अबॉर्शन इन इंडिया इज रेगुलेटेड अंडर द मेडिकल टर्मिनेशन ऑफ प्रेगनेंसी एक्ट व्हिच अलाउज अबॉर्शन इन टू सरकमस्टांसेस one where it concerns the woman's health that is the continuation of the pregnancy would either be a risk to the life of her or cause grave injury to her physical or mental health and two when there is a fetal abnormality such as that if the child was born it would suffer some physical or mental abnormalities such as um cardiac problems congenital disorders or brain anomalies in both circumstances it is a doctor's opinion that matters and not the woman's choice i mean yes the woman has to opt for it non consensual abortion is a crime carrying prison time up to 10 years but it's not really her choice you know it's only if the doctor decides yes we need to abort considering the mental health state in india i don't think doctors would really consider mental health as much as a big problem now the the law makes uh makes room for that kind of understanding and i'll come to that mm-hmm. um now according to the most recent uh, amendment to the act abortion is legally allowed until 20 weeks with the opinion of one doctor mm-hmm. between 20 to 24 weeks of gestation the opinion is of two doctors but for special categories of women uh, including survivors of rape victims of incest and other vulnerable women like dis- differently abled women and minors now the act allowed uh married women to opt for abortion in the case the contraceptive they use failed saying the anguish caused by such pregnancy may be presumed to constitute grave injury to mental health of the woman i'm pleasantly surprised now this was allowed only for married women which has now been opened up to unmarried women also because the act now says women woman and her partner as opposed to married women and her husband that used to be in the old act so wow great So if your contraceptive failed that is enough for you to get an abortion. Hmm. Hmm. Okay? But but there are many many procedures involved. There's lots of forms and lots of records to be maintained. Mostly because in India we also have to be careful of prenatal sex determination. That's right. right? PCP and DT oh, yeah. is used. Yes. I mean PCP and DT is the mm-hmm. act that is that basically regulates prenatal sex determination that is mm-hmm. uh that requires so many records to be maintained by doctors who Uh, conduct abortion and like ultrasound and everything in your pregnancy but i'm not going to get into that because it's a whole other can of worms yeah 
very sure. fascinated and pleasantly surprised for the most part about India's law. Yeah, largely. I, I mean, there was criticism that it's not enough. It's it's not still like fully choice based because for it sure. is still requiring a you know a doctor's medical opinion and all. But I think it's quite good. It's not a bounty system. Yeah, it's not a bounty system for sure. Even though legally abortion is allowed in India, I think the cultural messaging around it is very like holier than thou and sentimental, you know, like Mm -hmm. at least in multiple Bollywood films that deal with unplanned slash unwanted pregnancies, the language provides us like a personhood to a fetus or to to an embryo even, not even, you know, like with dialogues like, like we can't commit murder or let's not kill it, like essentially swaying the audience in favor of pro-life instead of pro-choice. And this is in very, very popular films like Salam Namaste, Zahir, Etras, and most recently Mimi. That film dealt, I think, very well with the concept of surrogacy. But abortion is still like the biggest no-no. And I think this uh, cultural condescension stems from the perception that one, women should not get to decide what to do with their bodies. And two, it's their moral responsibility to birth children. And so giving that up means somehow being less of a woman or less of the ideal Bharatiya Nari. And this, in turn, is actually dictated by decades and centuries of patriarchal thought that has established that a woman's worth is most as a mother. And like it's a sacred oath, a rite of passage that every female must go through, which is why it's like after one year of Shadi, they're like, where's the child? Where's the bacha? Where's your... I mean, you can skip this. Shadi mat karo to kahan se? Loopholes, Best. guys, loopholes. <laughs> so you think you think you will not be nagged for shadi if you're like you think it's that easy to escape? Oh DC no! Family? Shit, the loophole wasn't Sarah. that good. A loophole, Sarah. Clearly, you need to think like these texts and lawmakers, man. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Anyway, and in that moment, obviously, abortion is not an individual choice anymore, but a societal conflict, you know, where people like unaffected by it, like, you know, like they think it's their moral right to speak up and decide for the woman, like, oh, you must, how can you get it aborted? How can you kill this child? Like, Mm. anyway, it's now a communal matter, even though it's an individual person, like it's one woman going through nine months of severe body changes. Like, I don't know if you guys saw good news, but I like, I feel like I, when Karina Kapoor started talking of like how her body changed during pregnancy, I think that really, that made me realize a lot of what I took for granted. Like it was like, oh, you know, people, yeah. women are pregnant, but I didn't realize the, how much it actually harms and destroys your body. I really need to keep up with pop culture. You said good news and I'm just like, I was very confused. And you were like, Karina, I'm like, oh, movie. It's a movie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Just because we don't have Ragni this time. I know. Clearly, oh, I feel like Ragni would be like, yes. Like, I I honestly, like, sort of waited for her to be, like, unfortunate. Anyway. <laughs> and then, obviously, the actual, like, raising of the child that requires sufficient financial resources, at the very least. Yeah. Like, why is this a discussion about morality? Someone got pregnant, they decided they weren't ready, or or it was unwanted, and so it got aborted. On that note, we come to the end of this segment. We will be back after a short break. You're listening to Press Decode on the IVM Podcast Network. Eventually, you'll see the end of your childhood. Get accustomed to womanhood. Enjoy the experience of sisterhood. Might get to wifehood. Or not. Choose motherhood. Or not. You learn to define your personhood. Earn a livelihood. Change the neighborhood. And get rid of the falsehood that life post academia is easy. So join me, Ritasha. And me, Ayushi. On a journey from station starting point. To station, um, what now? Next station, Pudin station. And hopefully, Agla station, adulthood. Fresh episodes out every Thursday. Hello and welcome back to Press Decode on the IVM Podcast Network. We're Team Splainer and make sure you follow us at Splainer in on Instagram and Twitter to keep up with the Splainer fam. It's now time for some food for thought. Three years ago, a Banksy painting titled Girl with Balloon sold for one million pounds in an auction and was promptly self-destructed thanks to a shredder installed in the frame. This was part of an artistic plan to reflect the role of destruction in art. Or at least that's what art critics boldly claim. Or maybe Banksy was just messing with us all. Who even knows? (laughs) Anyway, that shredded painting, now retitled Love is in the Bin, is headed back to auction on October 14th this year, where it is expected to fetch even more money. 
I'm not going to actually ask you all to guess since we've carried the story before. But each time I go back to the figure and find out that it will cost anywhere between four million pounds to six million pounds, I need a moment to actually let it sink in. So here's me taking the moment. Yeah, man, my mm-hmm. scrap dealer would give like ten rupees for a kilo for that shredded painting. Uh, Banksy, if you're listening, just <laughs> competition out here. <laughs> That's it, ten rupees for a kilo. This will not form a kilo. <laughs> <laughs> so there will be there has to be more shredding involved for it to even form one. Yes. Anyway, okay, I get it. Okay, I'm gonna link a video of the shredding below, and it is objectively hilarious. Okay, all these hoity-toity artsy people are stunned. <laughs> they have no clue what hit them, <laughs> and God bless that poor soul who was all set to shell out the million pounds. But other than the initial amusement, I am just baffled. But like, have you seen the video? Because Uh, so the video is from 2018 where Banksy uploaded it on his YouTube and he shows how he put the shredder inside the frame and then how it ended up at the auction and how he pressed the button right before like people started looking at it and then it beep 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 and it started shredding and it like shredded only half of the painting the rest of it is unshredded okay but i mean at the end of that clip he tells you that in rehearsals it fully shredded like it was supposed to fully shred but it only partially shredded at the auction so i mean if it was just like noodles of the paper i don't even know if it would have been sold now like if they would yeah. they would have planned to sell it i don't know really wagda that's like another ironic part of like art and like destruction in art plus x2 it's like whatever could go wrong has gone <laughs> wrong <laughs> It's all art, guys. So anyway, Sadhvi's description of the new work of art reads: executed in two thousand eighteen, this work is unique. And well, they're not wrong. It shreds of paper with some paint, and it's worth millions of pounds. Sara, it is unique indeed. <laughs> it wrong. I wouldn't pay you a rupee, but when Banksy does it, I get where he's coming from. And I think to understand the story better, <laughs> you will have to listen. To who Banksy is, I think it's very important to know him as an artist and his philosophy. Because so his paintings, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar, but his paintings have always been statements against capitalism, the establish establishment war, and other such socio political subjects. Like you can see his murals all over the UK. He was discovered in the 1990s after he spray painted a bunch of stuff all over Bristol. and he's chosen to remain anonymous since he began his street art and so of course there's been a lot of speculation over his identity which isn't the focus of our conversation today but it's very very interesting like the conspiracy theories one of them actually is like he may be neil buchanan from art attack i don't know if you guys remember that ah. show <laughs> that one so so check it out if you're interested it actually has a really fun stuff anyway he started off as a graffiti artist but switched to stencil art soon which seems like a normal common enough thing to do i guess i mean i'm not an artist lol but i assume it's normal to switch mediums so no one would really question it but actually banksy has a very interesting reason he says and i quote as soon as i cut my first stencil i could feel the power there I also liked the political edge. All graffiti is low-level dissent, but stencils have an extra history. They've been used to start revolutions and to stop wars. And considering his satirical street art, I think it fits right in with the brand. Yeah, I have two from him that stuck out to me personally and might explain his brand of paintings well enough. Um, the first one is a 2004 artwork on paper titled Napalm, which shows the very famous and distressing sketch. of the nepang girl who was photographed running naked after the bomb went off in her village and it tore apart her clothes and scorched her skin and she's seen to be holding hands on one side with ronald mcdonald and the other side with mickey mouse which i think is a brilliant portrayal of the consumerist culture in america that fully disregards what the country does to those who aren't americans or foreigners or outsiders and the indifference on both like mickey mouse and ronald mcdonald's faces hits really hard and it makes you think and the most ironic part of this isn't even the okay so you know the shredding that happened which only went mm-hmm. halfway companies mm-hmm. like mcdonald's ronald mcdonald mcdonald's oh have God. used it in their ad campaign to show like fries coming out which is the i was like wow, wow read the room Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say, no one, no one let them read the room. Like this is marketing gone wrong, one on one. This is literally like we are trying to be 
banks is like oh capitalism no no and mcdonald's and this other like perry or another brands are like yes 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 we will use where is that come where's your logic <laughs> anyway the other painting that i really liked it's a mural actually is called love is in the air brackets flower thrower it's a 20 2003 mural in jerusalem which shows a masked man wearing a cap getting ready to hurl a bouquet of flowers uh, seemingly inspired by the flower power movement in the late 1960s where protesters held out flowers to soldiers and stuffed their rifles with flowers in a show of peaceful protest you guys should read more about it it's a very interesting movement that took place um except this one was in solidarity with the palestinians and in support of their rights so all in all i think it's very very strong commentary through art which goes to show that this shredded painting can have more value just because of the message of like non conformity that it sends across and like sara said like it totally sends these hoity toity art people into like a frenzy like what is going on so i feel like it's important to shake people's worlds sometimes you know see there i absolutely agree and i started off by saying it's hilarious but let's not forget what's actually selling here it's half a shredded painting that's selling for more than four to six times the price of the original i mean this is ridiculous what even is art i mean remember a few months ago we did a story on an invisible sculpture being sold for 18300 dollars uh, an italian artist salvatore garau auctioned an invisible sculpture titled lo sono i am that is immaterial basically it doesn't exist and you guys have to check out the story like i'll uh, link it in below he has instructions on how you're supposed to handle something that doesn't exist <laughs> okay i think we 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 can have a really good conversation on that sara so listeners if you would like us to talk about it please write in and we actually have a lot th- lot of things to say clearly sara is not convinced but i think vagda and i are pretty convinced that it can be i think you know at this point we should just come to accept that art can be very ridiculous at times okay i have never studied art and i would have totally been like this is bullshit like this is a this is total <laughs> total bullshit but sara green from art assignment on the youtube channel has like totally changed my perspective on art on their youtube channel yeah. there's a there's a video called uh, i could do that which is basically a non lazy answer to why a banana taped to a wall can be called art now i love the it's incredible like i remember vagda telling us to watch it and i think vagda you should totally link it because it's such a such a good video it is i will definitely link it so now i love this example that she uses of uh, felix gonzales torres who was a gay artist in new york in the 1980s He created this work titled Untitled Brackets Perfect Lovers which is nothing but two factory made clocks put up on a display wall synced together to show the same time now that viewed in itself might mean nothing to you and me but it's the context and the social and political underpinnings of that work that really move you or me at least so when you pay attention it is like two clocks in sync like two lovers hearts one likely to run out of battery before the other of course <laughs> of course <laughs> but no no it's like cliche and funny oh my god oh yeah so cheesy but torres made this like work in the background of aids which was raging through the city at that time people called it the gay virus so many artists lost their lives to this to aids in those years there was a lot of aids advocacy in art circles around that time and then torres lost his partner to aids in 1991 died himself of aids 5 years later so i don't know about you but like with all of this background when i see untitled perfect lovers on the wall i am moved by it i call it art i interjected too soon didn't i now i feel yes. horrible <laughs> no but i also think, but also like this painting makes me think that like another value i think that you can add to is the fact that this like just two clocks on this like empty wall which also goes to show how unacceptable it was to be even gay and aids is like a whole other yeah. thing so i think there's so much you can read into these things yeah. that like i also wouldn't if i hadn't watched this video i think i also would have taken it like oh i could do that yeah literally yeah but okay i come from the place of you're firstly paying and then you are also doing the labor of understanding what it is guys but I mean, that's what art is i mean if you don't see in if you saw any of banksy's uh, murals on the wall and you didn't know the context to his murals then it would be lost on you so that's the point exactly like the girl with the balloon like i don't think you would you would just see like i don't think if you saw it anywhere 
other than Banks, like if you didn't know Banks, he was the artist of that painting. I don't know how seriously you would consider it. Or even the Napalm Girl. Like if I saw the mural and I didn't know the background of the war, or then I, w- I wouldn't, it would be totally lost on me. That said, I do not understand the financials of the art business. To be honest, I don't understand the financials of any business. What Same. does the sh- why, why does the shredded painting sell for so much more? I don't understand. Or let's take, for example, this banana taped to a wall piece by Italian artist Maurizio Catalan. Have you guys seen that thing, by the way? It's a really iconic image. Plain wall with a banana taped to it with silver duct tape. Yeah. Yeah. You know how much it sold Wild, for yeah. in 2019? $120,000. What? Okay, I could do that. I could do that. <laughs> yeah. I refuse. Now, the intention of the work, it was titled Comedian, is to question the value placed on material goods. The spectacle, apparently, is as much a part of the work as the banana. I don't know what that means. But I also wonder what sold. Like, did you sell the wall? Did you sell the banana? Did you, like, rip the tape off and sell the banana? What what, what sold? I don't know. I'm sure they had very specific instructions on how to. Of course. Just like the. But what happens when the banana rots in, at best, a week? The artist has informed the buyers that they may replace the banana if they choose. (laughs) <laughs> okay so, so it's I not a one-time money. investment it's no, no, no. <laughs> i spend money for art i spend money then i spend labor in understanding art yes then i spend money on replacing bananas yes fun now the conclusion is basically that art is valuable because it makes you think but it is unaffordable and i'm okay with that because i just need food for thought not an extra chore of replacing a, replacing a banana every week <laughs> There we go. With that, we come to the end of our second segment. We will be right back after a short break. You're listening to Press Decode on the IBM Podcast Network. Hey, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On the longest constitution with Priya, find out what's obscene about obscenity and why artists and writers have been penalized for it. On Cyrus Says, Rochelle Rao joins Cyrus to talk about her amazing career in IPL and her comeback on The Kapil Sharma Show. Srinath Rangamani, Design Head at Swiggy, joins Kedar and Abhinit on Audio Gyan to take them through his design perspectives. Get all the updates regarding current immigration trends on Noyer Kanun when Umbar is joined by Shoshana T. Green and Alexandra Cole, experts from Green and Spiegel. And on The Fighting Goat, Arjun and Somesh talk about the epic MMA fights of the decade, controversies, and the end of Pride FC. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. And for Finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week on the network, Seat Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, CoinSwitch, Kuber, and Intuit India. Thank you so much for making this possible. Welcome back to the Press Decode on the IVM Podcast Network. It's time for our final segment this week, Roast or Toast. I'm going to go first since we've declared I'm the grump. Yes. Uh, thank, you. Thank, <laughs> you, thank you. Thank you. A new Silicon Valley company called Altos Labs is being funded by some of the richest people in the planet, including Jeffrey Bezos. It's big aim to use biological reprogramming to reverse aging in cells. In other words, find the secret to immortality. This, once again, is a why don't I have money to pull off something like this? And yuck, does this mean billionaires get to live forever and then buy shredded paintings? <laughs> but I think they, uh, they, should, <laughs> they should live together, live forever. I think life is not as fun. So they can uh, get to this. My God, what happened to our thing. cheerleader? Yeah, what happened to you, Adya? <laughs> yeah, it's, been a, it's been a week. All right. Okay, my least favorite story is that Mercedes-Benz has unveiled its Vision AVTR concept car. Which is, basically, it lets you do stuff just by thinking about it. Welcome to the future, my friends. You want to someone wow. wants to do my assignment? I will think about it and someone else can just write it for me. No, it's, it's a car. All you have to do is like focus on an array of light dots on the digital dashboard and it'll drive. You don't have to do anything. There's not like a steering wheel. There are no brakes, nothing, all of that. That's really scary. Actually. And it looks so snazzy and it's right up there with like the Batmobile and like science fiction cars. 
I think sometimes I think about their models because some science fiction writer imagined a car with snazzy lights and lights and tires, etc. Like, go look at that. Go look at that video. Oh my god. Anyway, I hate it. Why? Because I love driving. I love driving because it's a muscle memory thing. Like, it's like meditation. You can just do it because your body will remember it, and you can have an empty mind. Now, I don't want to like think about it and like consciously like concentrate on what I want and where I want to go and like I should be pressing the brake mm-hmm. now or whatever. It just happens on its own. There's no fun in driving if I have to, you know, think about it. But I get that it will be a very good thing for people who are wheelchair bound, you know. But I really hope it doesn't become the new smartphone. Also, like people go for, go to drive like to clear their head. And if you're making me focus on this when I'm trying to be relaxed, because for a lot of people driving is relaxing, like that's, that's yeah counterproductive. Yes. I have two thoughts. Yeah, for me, I don't know how to drive. This is going to be great. Not that I can <laughs> afford it. I need some money. Anyone wants to sponsor this for me? Yay. <laughs> two. Vakta, what do you mean no brain while driving? I am incredibly concerned. No, no. This is because, this is probably like, because you don't know how to drive right now. How to it's, drive. It's like cycling, right? Like you would never really forget it. Like it just. You don't have to think about it. It just happens on its own. Like your muscles just do it. Exactly. I am never sitting in a car with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, <laughs> my favorite item this week was a quote from our Tuesday edition by Laurie Santos, Yale's happiness professor, who I'm sure all of you all have heard of because this happiness course was so popular all through the pandemic. Anyway, the quote goes, The irony is, if we put more fun into our lives, then we wind up becoming more productive because fun makes you feel alive by definition, gives you a little bit more energy. It allows you to take a break. And I fully stand by that. Like, you know, capitalism really encourages this culture of overworking and one-upping each other. Like how I stayed up until like 7 a.m. last night and I stayed up until like 8 a.m. last night. But like, I slept for 10 hours last night and I'm very happy about it. Yeah, man. I would be very happy if I got 10 hours of sleep. Exactly. So I feel and like I want that. Really be celebrating that. And yes, so I do. I, that's why I was, this quote made me very happy. It's like, I'm legitimizing fun for you. Go have fun. And I was like, yes. That's a great note to end on. That was our show this week. Thank you so much for joining us on Press Decode. You can catch us every Thursday on the IVM Podcast Network. And guys, please remember, don't let the news give you the booze. From uncensored and unfiltered chats with the who's who of the entertainment industry, I, Siddharth Kanan, bring your very heart chat show called Candid Kanan. Tune in every Friday on the IVM podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're a cricket fan, check out Edges and Sledges, India's favorite cricket podcast. The podcast focuses on Indian cricket the IPL and has a ton of banter both on and off the field. We talk about the week's biggest cricket stories with current and ex-international cricketers, coaches or sometimes just between us. And it's hosted by me, DJ. Me, Varun. And me, Ashwin. New episodes release every week. You can catch us on the IVM Podcast website, app or wherever you get your podcasts from. Check out the Edges and Sledges Cricket Podcast.